We're so packed in, we're starting two minutes early. I think that's uh, great. Uh, I'm Neil Denari, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the vice chair uh, of the school. Hope you enjoyed the drinks and snacks and stuff. Um, before I introduce uh, Shohei, I should say that uh, November 15th, please come back. Thomas Auer from Transolar will be giving a lecture. That's on the 15th, and three days later, on November 18th, Patrick Schumacher will be here with his brand of stuff um, to, to challenge us. So we've got a different uh, proposition tonight. Um, just a little bit of background on Shohei Shigematsu. He's uh, from Fukuoka in Kyushu. He went to Kyushu University, uh, studied architecture, and he graduated also from the Berlaffa in um, Holland. It was uh, 1997. He finished in 1998. He joined OMA, and so that makes uh, 15 years now. Uh, since 2006, he has run the office in the U.S., uh, uh, based in New York, and they take care of the projects in North America and also various projects in Asia and other parts of the world. Um, you know, a number of years ago, while I was director at SIAR, um, I hired uh, two people, one who worked for OMA, Christoph Kornever, who of uh, UCLA. Uh, this was 1998, and I hired Tom Wiscombe, who had worked for Paul Himmelblau. And uh, a number of the faculty said, why are you hiring people who work for the people that we want to hear from? <laughs> I said, uh, people like Ram and, and Wolf with offices that are you know, increasing, their access becomes less and less. So it's a, kind of an issue of function. Number two, um, especially OMA. OMA runs an office um, that despite what the media may think or maybe you think is a, is a project of uh, multiple people and multiple personalities. So uh, Shohei Shigematsu is a, is a, a deadly serious uh, element to uh, the whole operation. Um, I'm sure it wouldn't be the same without him. So his talent and his energy, which you know runs the office in New York, is incredibly uh, specific, I think, to the ideas that go on. Not only that continue a trajectory of the work, but bring in, I think, proprietary ideas that um, may affect the kind of local conditions of the, uh, of the office. Um, I would say that OMA might be, this is, this is my kind of crackpot position, I'd say out of every office in the world, OMA is the only office that you have to know about. Um, you might like a lot of other offices. Um, you might not even like OMA, but you have to know about them. I was just outside saying that um, I'm an OMA scholar uh, because I think you have to know about them. Um, <clears throat> You know, when you think about an office that, on the one hand, is sometimes as proclaimed, we don't do form, we're interested in, in the generic, but who otherwise indulge in form sometimes, uh, but don't do it um, as a counterproposal to, let's say, what the Calvinist uh, uh, intense, rigorous, pragmatic project is. And to me, that's why I'm interested. I don't know what's going to happen the next time. And I think for a lot of offices, um, you know exactly what they're going to do. So let's see what's going to happen tonight. Shokei okay. Shigimatsu. Abe-san and I never really met in Japan, but uh, I met him a couple of times in New York. Um, you know, his alphabet, alphabetical order is so early, and I called him, miscalled him on my old cell phone a couple of times in the middle of the night, so I was suspected that he hates me, but he was kind enough to invite me. 
and Neil. When I was at Berlage, we had a joint studio between Berlage and uh, SciArc, and uh, I know him since. So I'm very uh, honored to be here. I go very fast, and I already predict that it's going to go to 70 minutes. I know that 60 minutes is a mark, but uh, please don't get bored. I show many images. Um, so we have, since uh, Rem established the office, the office has evolved. Um, now we have many offices in the world, about 300 architects and doing more than 100 projects at the time. So you can imagine that kind of operation uh, is a very different one as Neil was implying, uh, not just led by a figurehead. So I'm basically dealing with New York office that is uh, dealing with South America and also partially Japan. LA is a heartbreaking city for me because um, when I started at the office, uh, I was dealing with the Universal Headquarters, and you can't imagine how many projects OMA had given a love to in a project in LA. So this one, uh, when I was very young, uh, viewing one of the tower, uh, 2000, we did the Tashin House, 2001, the, the very famous LACMA, now the same, kind of same, uh, Architecture is going to be up uh, twice as uh, expensive. Uh, Caltrans, we lost Tom May. Uh, Caltech, Caltech, we got fired. Uh, this was in uh, San Cal, it's in uh, Century City where Jean Nouvel won against us, but now it's uh, another, someone else is doing. Uh, 2007 in downtown LA, next to Viviana, uh, Viviana uh, the church. We were doing a project, never got realized. Uh, house for Vincent Caro, never got realized. House for a film producer, never got realized. We pitched for a house for Tommy, Tommy McGuire, upbeat by Pintor. Um, um, 2010 uh, Broad Museum. Then I would like to start from this one because today's uh, talk is mainly about art world and the mixed use that we're doing. Uh, as you know, Broad Foundation, the location next to Disney Concert Hall, you know how co his collection dominates the art world. Also, he lends uh, the art to everywhere in the world. But now he wanted to have finally his own, which was confined to a very strict rule gallery. Uh, all this uh, thing was absolutely uh, something that we could not break. So it was more or less a skin job. Uh, what's also weird was that uh, the, the museum will be flanked by two residential towers. Um, so as you know, the site, uh, it's, it's based on uh, this kind of long lasting uh, dream of LA to have a pedestrian circulation, uh, which you know is about to come true, I think. Uh, but only thing we thought we could change is that maybe the state of ground floor because the archive and gallery were very strict uh, in his programming. Um, so we thought that the ground floor could be a very dynamic place reflecting his involvement to LACMA and MOCA and also involvement also to the spatial relationship to the plaza to come. First thing we did was to reflect, the, uh, of course, the icon on an opposite manner. So some kind of a, a negative profile uh, that is, uh, resembles Disney. But we decided in the end to uh, um, actually just keep it simple, just to make the open ground floor, uh, exposing some archive and creating a maximum contrast to Disney. Uh, so this is the... Uh, um, program allocation, this display storage activity, and the central portion is structurally uh, sustaining the cantilever and also giving services both above and below. Uh, as opposed to his, uh, uh, called his model plan, which was given, we basically open half of the archive to open archive so that it can spill out uh, by notion to the plaza. And we love this contrast that the Disney has an active core but dead perimeter, and here you have the dead core and the active perimeter. Uh, 
so we went to the second round to rethink of the uh, um, facade, because in the first phase, the facade was very abstract. This is archive level, this is a top <coughs> level. Um, so we started to think, what could it be? And we came up with a solution that, uh, well, uh, that it's the same material, but the, with a different texture. So one is smooth, a titanium, and this one, the same a metallic facade with a different texture, with embossed. So we look, started looking at other poss well, possibilities. But the problem of a metal panel is that once you conceive a mold, you just replicate and it just becomes always the same. Then you start to read the repetition of the panels. So we didn't like that. So we found this uh, uh, system called explosion foaming. Basically, you put the metal panel and a bunch of stones inside the a basin, and you explode uh, each time. So the stone hits the mold in a random manner. So the metal panel is the same, the basin is what, just one basin, but it creates uh, it every time a different pattern. So you can see even the texture of stone hitting the um, uh, metal. So which, this is a contrast we liked, that uh, uh, somehow it's the same material, but it has a completely different texture. And it captures the light in a very different manner. Um, but, of course, uh, it looked like uh, someone threw stones at uh, <laughs> Disney, so you, you, you know why we lost. <laughs> um, just to talk about myself, I'm from Japan originally, and, you know, Japan, since I was born, it marked a significant decline in its econ economical growth, uh, marked by like, a couple of major incidents. And of course, uh, my uh, life actually coincides with those major incidents quite well. So I was always interested in what it means to uh, live uh, under post-crisis or in a recession. So this is my parents' uh, economy uh, uh, represented in a graph, and this is mine. So I, I always was interested in the potential of the uh, post-crisis. This is the architecture in the 60s by Japanese. Um, it has sense of gravity, sense of material, sense of edge. But now this is one of the mainstream that has no edge, no color, no sense of gravity. A lot of people think that this is a kind of Japanese aesthetic, but I personally think this is definitely caused by a uh, um, long-lasting long recession that uh, was more than 20 years. So I was interested in the potential of recession, so I did some studios about it. And in, in short, the conclusion is that the, the uh, economic indicators goes down. Basically, the uh, human indexes, such as planning, connecting, thinking, feeling, will go up conversely. So for example, the, 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 the typology that gets built most when it's in recession is, of course, the religious architecture like this one, a mega church. And also, if you look at the history of inventions, a lot of inventions actually happen when, the, you know, the recession, when the company puts more money on R&Ds. And obviously, Auburn and Architectural Manifestos were also written during the uh, recessions. Um, while I, I was doing that, I, you know, the, uh, the tsunami came and I was confronted as a Japanese living abroad to do something and I was interested in doing, go, going back to the idea of big ideas in Japan, which was diminished after the 70s. So in, in Japan, when the economy was going up, a lot of architects projected a national planning, uh, but now no one does it because, you know, the uh, architects withdrew from that kind of domain. In Japan. What's interesting about this uh, uh, crisis is that uh, Japan also faces other difficulties such as population decrease. In, in 40 years uh, there will be basically half of its population now. But still the urban area around Tokyo will be the first uh, most urbanized area in the world, 37 million people. Uh, so I thought that maybe infrastructural project could do something about it. Uh, this is a New Deal 
So when there is a recession, probably there needs to be bigger idea rather than when it's uh, um, uh, going up. And as you know, Ram was always interested in modernization, and basically I'm the next generation who confronts the, uh, coming from Japan, confronting uh, not the modernization, but demodernization. So I was also interested in how to deal with that as my generation. Uh, Japan is interesting, of course, in, in its geography. This is Silk Road. Japan has been always a terminus of any world's global network. So I thought that you can also be frivolous about it. This is a global uh, oil and transportation network, also in Tokyo. Uh, like this kind of modernization basically ends at Tokyo, that gets connected through Korea, through China, and Central Asia, now eat all the way to Middle East and Europe. Uh, but after that, we don't have any responsibility to pass it on. So uh, I think Japan has a, a privilege to be um, frivolous about what to do in this uh, network. So what I discovered is that uh, Tokyo, well, Japan still has been planning this maglev since 70s. Now it's finally coming uh, true. Um, it's it's going to connect uh, from Tokyo to Osaka in 55 minutes. But this is a kind of strange notion because they started planning in 70s and now when the country is going to decline, they finish. So I wanted to make best use of that. So I wanted to create this, use this 55 minutes, almost treating Tokyo and Osaka as one big city that liberates uh, a north uh, to much more <coughs> alternative urbanization. So I use the Olympic uh, mm -hmm. as a model. So as you might know, Tokyo has been has awarded the Olympic uh, uh, twice. Once was canceled because of the war in 64, as you know, and now we got it. This was proposed before the Olympic. So what I suggested to the Japanese government, actually, uh, is that not, not to do 2020, but wait till the maglev finishes, that's 2027, so 2028, and don't call it Tokyo Olympic, but Japan Olympic. Because this is the two mayors, Tokyo and Osaka, they are very close. And there was a notion after the tsunami to create a backup city in Osaka. Backup city means uh, you basically uh, you come alive to be the new uh, government center when the Tokyo fails with the uh, uh, new earthquake. Uh, uh, and as you might know, or it's actually quite stunning that Tokyo, Japan has changed 42 times its capitals in history. So I thought it was actually quite conceivable to create a new alternative government model mixed with Olympic ambition. So this was a, a Osaka airport that it will be turned into a backup city, backup government center. So what I propose with Columbia students is that to distribute the government function and the Olympic venue along the Maglev train, which is made in, inland because to, to be safe from a tsunami and earthquake. Um, uh, so that uh, every stop of Maglev you have government function and Olympic venue and reinforce the idea that Tokyo and Osaka is one big city. I presented to the guy who started, he's a congressman, he really hated it. Uh, so we were kicked out like in 10 minutes. Um, so I was, so I grew up in Japan with no, knowing the true modernization, so I was very interested in China because, you know, where the modernization is truly happening as an architect. Uh, so this is CCTV, which I go through very quick. It was an incredible um, a project. This is the second biggest building in the world after uh, Pentagon. And I was project architect from competition to design development. Now it's in full operation, and you can see how it appears in the city. And since, of course, when I did the competition was 2001, uh, China has, of course, changed incredibly since then. This is a lobby. It's called, it's said to be the biggest lobby in the world. Hmm. 
Um, and also, I did a competition in Shenzhen that also got finished. It's a stock exchange tower, so the horizontal part contains the uh, stock exchange function, and the vertical part contains the offices. So it was, of course, an incredible experience as a Japanese to be really feeling the modernization <coughs> and be in China for a while. Until 2005, I was involved in many of the Chinese projects. And then um, I took over New York office. Uh, and this was the first project that we did uh, at New York office. So this is an um, architecture and planning uh, building for Cornell. So you can see that the arts court is this side. The four, uh, three disciplines were in the same college, architecture, art, and planning. They were in the different buildings or different wings, so they didn't really talk to each other, so they didn't collaborate and exploit the potential of the interdisciplinary study. So they wanted to have a new building. Also, this side was completely neglected, as you can see. Uh, office, they, these were offices, surprisingly, and uh, it was only parking. Uh, so what we did is to define the building with just an existing line. So this is almost like finding a site. And also at the same time connecting three buildings. Creating uh, like a mini art squad on the north side. Uh, emphasizing the direction towards the gorge. Um, it's hugs, it touches the RAM, which is a studio building, and it hugs the uh, former library wing in Sydney, and it kind of uh, looms over the foundry, which is a sculpture uh, class. So the activity is uh, basically continuous, and it can't give us over the existing road, providing bus stop. Because it's defined by the existing building, it has this kind of moment where uh, it's kind of mysteriously loop, uh, cantilevering from both ends of the existing building. In order to achieve this cantilever, we had to have trusses inside. But if we use a conventional truss, which is the cheapest, you have many dead spaces to, for students to walk through. So we came up with a hybrid truss, which is looking at the circulation and the stress. We kept certain parts in the center uh, Virendale, and then gradually became trusses, uh, trust towards the, towards the edge. Was fabricated in Canada, so you can see how it's traveling here. Uh, the inside was also open-ended, almost like a conglomeration of uh, classrooms in one big space. So. As an architect, we could involve in uh, programming in a pedagogical manner, not just architecturally, so that was rewarding. So this is one big space. So now it's how it's used. Uh, people start to, of course, students are very good at using buildings unexpectedly. The exhibition in a Hiding, <laughs> another hiding. This guy invented the hammock, <laughs> uh, playing, moving. It's all, this is only allowed because we consolidated every possible infrastructure to the roof, ceiling system, so the air, the uh, light, energy, uh, skylights, uh, everything. So the, this, this is the coordination of the beam ten penetration and so on. So you can see this is quite technical. The, uh, the floor is just a radiant heating that assures the flexibility over time. This is how it meets the whole building. There is another element, uh, which is a concrete dome that intersects this box above. This is where when it intersects. We wanted to provide also another construction technique that is not steel, but concrete for the students to know. So it's pretty different, the atmosphere of the top and the bottom. And also provides this kind of a, a, a moment where uh, the underside has uh, become a public space. It's 
So this is a concrete dome where it was completely different pr uh, process to steel, which was very controlled and fast. Here we struggled a lot to uh, cast, basically. So this is like three layers of plywood applied to make a complete smooth and negative, and then cast. It was casted in a, a one go overnight. This is an exterior quick space where it has light features. It attracts like an urban activity, which was never there in Ithaca before. <laughs> <laughs> These guys started playing before the photo shoot, so we had to protect. Uh, now, they were very uh, not so up for having such a covered exterior space because, as you know, it's very cold, but uh, uh, they are very happy now using it. Uh, just to reinforce the idea of being the in, in, interior, although you were covered exterior space, we use this American tin ceiling, tin cladding as a motif, but much bigger, four, four by four feet, which was only possible to press in the car manufacturer, so we, we did it in the car factory. So you can see this uh, tin ceiling that emphasize the continuity from inside to outside, but also give some sense of interior. Uh, there's an auditorium here, which you can access from the studio down, but also, of course, you can enter from everywhere. So this is going down from the studio. Uh, this is the auditorium on top of the dome. Because it's covered um, by the um, plate, you can actually secure certain darkness that is needed, so you can actually have projection here while you're even having open uh, scene around it. Uh, which was, it was funny because uh, in the recession this project was on hold, but the uh, university came up to us and said, if you can turn this place into a, also a university boardroom, which was never really planned, they, they, they're going to fund us. So we had to quickly retrofit. Uh, boardroom. The current boardroom is this kind of very boring uh, 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 interior in Cornell. We looked at other means of uh, <coughs> seats for the boards. So we came up with this idea that, okay, every board should be recognized. Why don't we give them a first-class seat instead of this kind of wooden uh, table? Uh, but the problem is that it only happens twice a year. So we had to either move the chairs somewhere else or you had to... Uh, built in, so we decided to embed them uh, under the floor so that it actually uh, comes out twice a year as if, you know, dead, uh, from the dead from the graves. <laughs> <laughs> we thought that was also a nice uh, idea for the day. You can see this is a fast forward. <laughs> It actually swivels, so you can actually go any direction easily. And it has voting system, microphone, and the coffee cup folder <laughs> in every sense. So it has a dramatic transformation. Even the seat uh, folds down, so you can change from this to this, to that. <coughs> and this is how it is. Uh, under the dome, it's a quick space. There's a bridge that you can look down to. And there's a movable wall, that flexible wall, that can configure to have different, uh, let's say, uh, crit simultaneously, like this. This is a representative picture that we like. So people, this, there's a bus stop outside here, so a lot of non-architectural, let's say, uh, regular students or citizens waiting for the bus, looking down for the architecture crit, and you can also observe the other studios crit from the bridge. Again, the bus and the crit. And they do uh, have parties. Uh, there's a huge elevator, we call it a moving room, because we knew that art and architecture students need a big freight to bring it down to the crib, so it's, they're already using it very well, which is visible 
from outside, moving room. Uh, we even designed the bathroom, which is a single uh, plane of molded um, uh, metal. So basically, you are always are next to the different gender. From the <laughs> so you, have, you can maintain your tension. <laughs> So the entry, the signage is uh, very obscure, deliberately, so you don't really know which one is woman or which one is man. <laughs> if you know the, of course, the system, you know this size is man, but people can get easily confused. <laughs> Obviously, it's full height, so you don't hear the sound. <laughs> Uh, the roof is also mobilized uh, for the skylights. As you go further to the center, it's darker, so uh, the skylights gets bigger. And the green pattern that also bridges from court to the porch. So now I go to Art World. I go very quickly. I did Whitney project. Uh, this was one of my first projects uh, as a project architect in OMA. It was a very difficult project. Uh, it was just before 2001, 911 happened. Basically, the final board presentation was scheduled 911, so I was in New York when it happened. Um, it got cancelled, as you know, even rental piano took over, and then even that became uh, too much to do in Upper East Side in New York because it's a very conservative neighborhood. Um, but now the new building is about to be done in High Line. So it was, of course, it's always a heartbreaking moment when you see your building in the history of a, as a news, in the newspaper, and then you see the new one. Um, of course, now the there's a conspiracy theory which I like that uh, OMA and Friends of Piano workshop in the same office. <laughs> As you know, like we start and he they, he takes over <laughs> in the case of Whitney and Mark. Um So Quebec, uh, we're doing a, a museum now finally in Canada. Um, Canada. Um, so in Quebec, there's a museum in the Battlefield Park, an existing one, blue one. The, the museum, for the first time, got a site uh, adjacent to the main boulevard of the city. So what we did is to almost peeling the ground, letting park continue over it, and letting city come in underneath. So every possible uh, entity that is uh, in its uh, at stake is uh, extending. So park is extending, art is extending, city is extending. So you can see that the topography of the park actually continues over and the city continues under. Uh, the three boxes are just a representation of needed gallery spaces. So this is from the city, it has a uh, very tall entrance hall or grand hall. But What's interesting thing about Canada is that uh, in museum they don't raise, they are not 100% based on uh, private funding, so they have to raise their own fund, half of them. So they have to do events. So almost this is a museum that uh, is hovering above the event, event space. So this is a ticketing that's a, again grand hall. And here you can do any kind of event, art event or wedding. Uh, or a performance. Uh, this is the uh, courtyard between the protected church and the circulation that is adjacent to the gallery space. There's a tunnel that connects to the existing building. There's an atrium that connects to the second floor. And the second to third, we go out from the building looking over the uh, green the park in front of it. And then up you will see uh, um, the uh, church. Now the facade is uh, three layers. Triple glazing, this because it's very cold here. Three, triple glazing is considered not such a uh, uh, good you know, uh, unit for architects. It's a kind of a heavy handed unit. But we try to use that triple glazing as a basically means to give some depth. 
So we give, gave different frit patterns and different texture in each layer to give certain depth, and also created a pattern that reflects the structure behind in a very subtle manner. So you can see the frit here. It's under construction now. Um, we have done these kind of institutional museums, uh, many of them, but never so successful. But we are now seeing some success in dealing with uh, private collectors, although it didn't work with Eli. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the most upcoming collectors from Philippines, Robbie Antonio. The site is, in, the site is here, um, in the residential district, where it's kind of most expensive residential district. And he wanted to have a museum villa, which is half museum and half uh, villa. He's uh, well known as the kind of uh, someone for the first time bringing something, some brand to the Philippines. Uh, and he was also very into architecture, so he gave us almost like a, a, this thick uh, book of what he likes, <laughs> and with comments like this. And then even just to go through that book was uh, like a month's work, and then somehow extracted some of uh, his key comments, like major wow feature, <laughs> waterfall feature, again, Grand staircase, uh, uh, many many of the wilds. <laughs> anyway, also started to kind of collect and sort out his requests. Even made this abstract diagram, sort of mapping what he wants, and then creating some kind of that uh, vague connections between like a stained glass and, <laughs> and a folding water <laughs> visible. Or car elevator and a black elevator mall. Anyway. It was, so basically, we decided to surrender because it was, of course, very clear if his contract came with a kind of book. So we took it seriously and accommodated his request as much as possible. Again, blue is uh, private, public is red. Uh, arranged in, uh, in such a manner. But we needed something that governs the whole thing because it was so eclectic. So we discovered that he loves black, so we actually proposed him to create a kind of black skin, black concrete skin that basically kind of absorbs all his eclectic uh, wishes. So in the end, it's like this falling water entrance, uh, private window. Got a staircase to the roof, again falling water. Uh, so the ground level is uh, kind of a loop of very fluid space. Uh, he also is obsessed with commissioning artists to do his portraits. So Schnabel, Tashapel, Murakami, Opi. So anyway. So the first gallery will be all about him <laughs> in a black environment. But he also started to not collect but commission more to integrate to architecture. So this is uh, Jenny Holzer integrated to the stair. This is Barbara Kruger integrated to the car ramp. So somehow it became more and more interesting. The building became the canvas to uh, reflect his collection. Even with. So this is, it's actually almost finished. This is a pool, which is visible here if you're swimming from the courtyard. This is a rotating bar, it's there for the second floor gallery. Um, another, <laughs> another person who we dealt with is a visionary also. He, he came to our office uh, one day saying, why is cinema with one screen? Uh, I, want I think cinema can have more screens. We agreed to it. 
he started developing. Um, so he, he liked number seven, so quickly the number was determined, seven. So we went immediately outside using this kind of really low tech cameras. What does it mean to film with seven cameras at the same time? So this was actually the real camera that they used to film in Doha. And this is a final configuration. Of course, it went back and forth, but one above, one below, one size, and three squares in the center. First of all, we did this kind of uh, uh, thing that the, the box is a kind of magic box that opens and becomes a seven screen, uh, and then the seats were different. Or we did this kind of uh, slightly kind of futuristic object that uh, accommodates seven screen and it becomes uh, some kind of UFO. Or we can sell this thing as a small Google uh, for him. But it was quickly decided that we have to, the first show will be in Khan film festival, which the typical con happens here, but our site was here next to abandoned uh, casino. Because it was so quick, uh, we had to use existing structure, so we didn't have chance to design the uh, pavilion. So we had to choose out of these four typologies, but we chose this one, because we liked also this black uh, ambitious tent. But as you know, he actually uh, admires this kind of ancient motif. And, and you know, <laughs> you know his uh, his sign for, uh, for Jay Z, and we thought it was very beautiful his uh, sign, so we, we chose the pyramid. And also, we uh, we were actually happy that we chose the existing kind of tent because during the con, you, as you know, there are so many tents that houses events, so we can disguise ours also as theirs. Uh, so the only thing we did is to cut the small beams here and then make gigantic beams <coughs> and then hang all the necessary screens and sound systems and projectors. Uh, also we did, uh, of course, uh, were a little bit ironical in Khan nowadays that uh, it's much more important to be on red carpet than an actual film, so we extended the red carpet inside the film so that you can still be in the red carpet inside the screen, and then you can even evacuate to, through the red carpet. Because it was very important for a lot of celebrities to come, uh, you know, there are a lot of paparazzi here, they could escape without being seen. So this was the final configuration, it was erected. And we made this uh, almost like a uh, floating pyramid. Um, because in Cannes, of course, the bay is quite beautiful, but also at this moment in Cannes, like there are 20 most rich boats uh, in the world parked in the bay, so you can actually see those from this slit. But obviously, you wanted to have some relation to the landscape around. And this shed is actually a structure rather than a shed, so you can hang everything. And this was uh, the seven screens. So you, you can see they use the seven screens well, sometimes ceiling and the floor, uh, sometimes everything in one, uh, sometimes one is slow motion, one is fast forward. It was very well made. So this was. Um, Another person, uh, this is an Argentine developer called Faena. Uh, he bought this building in Buenos Aires uh, in Puerto Marrero when it was completely abandoned, a silo, uh, turned into a most successful hotel. Since then, he became uh, one of the most successful developers in Buenos Aires using the culture. So basically, he always used the culture as a kind of aura, so not just development. So after that, as you saw the first picture, it became one of the most expensive real estate in Buenos Aires. So he came uh, to uh, Miami Beach here uh, to do the same. Because this central point of Miami Beach was kind of abandoned, uh, although it was very vibrant before. So he bought this entire compound, and then we were to do the three buildings here. So this is a renovated hotel, condominium of uh, Norman Foster. We're going to do three buildings. One is the event space, one is a hotel, one is a parking. 
code, right? So we claimed, we basically inserted two volumes here as one big building uh, to claim uh, that is the center of the compound. And then made uh, one big uh, event space, one is domed and cylinder, and one is a black box, can be used differently or at once. This is the space, you can use it at once, or you can use it separately. Um, there's a, a rival that the landscape slides under, and because of that we made a cantilever immobilize the skin to that. So in, in, Miami, in Miami Beach you need a hurricane proof grill overlaid with uh, this kind of arches that sustains a cantilever overlay, and that becomes a skin. Uh, the circulation is a spiral. You enter and you basically go up from the free function to the uh, main room and to the roof garden. So this is a rival. You go up the stair. There's a pre-function room, which you can also do a small event. You go up to the main room. This dome. And also the other side, we designed a kind of very small marina where the boat can dock. And then VIP can arrive and enter from the other side. From here to the hall uh, B. Lobby, atrium, and then it's the whole B, where you can, there's a big window to appreciate the creek on the other side. Dome has a spiral uh, structure, it's a structure, and also has balconies. Where you can look down to the event. And this is the um, uh, roof garden. This is a parking. Every famous architect is now building a parking in Miami Beach. This is luckily ours is not driving parking garage, but mechanical one. So the only thing we did is to expose the mechanical elevator, so you can see cars up there going up and down. And there's a restaurant here that people are also moving next to the cars up and down. Some people start. <coughs> Um, this is also quite an interesting project. Uh, Marina Abramovich, you know her, you might know her, she's uh, one of the most celebrated performance artists nowadays. She has been doing this long duration of performance with her, with her uh, partner, but now alone. Um, now this was, for example, three months performance. She's starting from one side of the Great Wall. Uh, her boyfriend starting from the other side and meeting at the center. She lived in front of everyone. And as you know, recently she did a very successful MoMA um, uh, piece. Uh, the site is in Hudson, upstate New York, close to uh, Mass Mocha, Bard College, via Beacon. In an old a community theater, uh, turned into an indoor tennis court. You can see the vague line of the tennis court. They fill the concrete to the slope of the theater. And they, the tennis court didn't fit, so they even carved out the balcony in the shape of a uh, uh, tennis court, like this. So it's kind of weird, but we like it, obviously. And the, we inserted the white box, which everyone would do, uh, to house all these uh, different types of events or uh, theater. Uh, we have two theaters. One is a small one here that can work together. So this, like everything looks kind of the same, but the only difference is that she wants this place to only house an event or a performance over six hours. So anything that can happen here needs to be over six hours. So we have identified three consequences architecturally to the three uh, to the long duration. So typically, the performer and audience has a very strong relationship. But in her uh, or long, long duration of performance, it's so long that basically you create a second line of uh, audience who cannot, of course, stay more than six hours. 
we looked at other examples how to interpret this architecturally. For example, baseball stadium is quite interesting because, as you know, baseball can be very long and at the times boring. So the concourse is actually designed recently that uh, the recent trend is that it's quite open. So even if you're in concession, you can actually feel the uh, game, not necessarily watching, engage. So that we thought was interesting to be stay, stay connected while you're doing something else. Also, as you know, the sky bar, you can look down. And this was a kind of extreme case in uh, Arizona where you can do completely uh, different thing, not even carrying them. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought it was actually quite interesting, as opposed to the very binary uh, relationship of the lobby and performance, we basically surround the performance space with the lobby and concourse. And even, not just that, but uh, even with the other program, always looking down at the performance space, so that you can always stay connected. So while you're reading, we designed a, this window that is uh, in the shape of a reading uh, room, or the classroom also has a window to look down. In the circulation, you can look down. That's one consequence. The second consequence is Abramovich method. She did invent this method called Abramovich method, which, you know, typical case, the performer trains themselves. That's quite common. But what she invented, invented is that she trains an audience to be the certified audience for the long duration of performance. So she goes through all this kind of meditational method to train the audience, I guess. And then you get certified. <laughs> so we array those training rooms uh, in a circuit so you can start in one place and then come back to it and you are now certified audience. <laughs> But what's interesting about this uh, issue is that uh, this is in Milan. So these people are doing Abramovich method, basically trying to be an audience. They are not performers, but there will be a secondary audience who looks down to the trying to be the certified audience. So you have this kind of strange layer of audience looking at the audience, and no one really knows who the performer is. <laughs> So instead of this kind of typical case where everyone look at the performer, in this theater, in some cases, you will be looking at everywhere. So that's also an interesting consequence. The third is a chair. So we, this is a chair she used in MoMA. So it was, uh, the, the toilet was better because she couldn't move. So of course, in the typical theater, uh, two or three hours, maybe max, uh, but six hours longer, you have to invent chairs. <laughs> so, typical way to do it long duration is like this, also happens in our office, quite often. Uh, or in a space station, hospital, airline, or someone like her, she also does something else while she's working. It's actually quite nice. So we decided to combine a chain of mobility to the comfort, so something like this. But right now, the design, we have to still develop, but design is something like this, quite crude. She likes it because it looks like coffins. <laughs> so you can see like, a, you can see if one is sleeping here, and you will shock. Uh, she thinks form of sleeping in a, is a great response to the performance. So she wants to treat sleeping people well. So she, that's why the mobility is important, because she, her staff wants to roll the sleeping person <laughs> and secure it into a slightly more calm chamber. Uh, we made this model uh, that you can actually fit your head in and observe this uh, different model. <laughs> so that became almost like a symbol. We did the uh, uh, fundraising. She did a, cr a cloud uh, fundraising recently, Kickstarter, and very successful in this model. It became so, such an uh, object that is known that recently I had a, a photo shoot from Surface magazine, and they didn't even want to have my face. 
<laughs> this model as a substitute. Uh, we are doing for her a cultural center in Montenegro, uh, changing the former fridge factory by Tito into a cultural destination. Uh, with that, now I'm also doing with Columbia students um, perineology. So my theory is that uh, after Bilbao effect, a lot of money has been shifting to, towards not to the iconic museums anymore, but to the event. So this is the uh, amount of uh, biennials in the world right now, 196. So in a given moment in 2013, September, you have 22 biennials set happening at the same time in the world. And you can imagine how, what the circulation of uh, art collectors, uh, curators, artists is. It's always a usual suspect, that's also a problem. And what's problem is that biennialogy actually now is being established as a, as a theme, and they even have biennial foundation, but we discovered that there is no architects involved. And so I just wanted to claim that the architects are probably needed for such uh, events or forum, because you know what's in historically happened. For example, Documenta. But interesting thing about biennial is that Unlike the Bilbao, which is very visible as a, as a museum, it, it just transforms the city when it happens, but it's not so visible, like Documenta. And also it comes often with other agenda, like politics, like Guangzhou in Korea, which is now one of the most successful biennials in the world. Or this one in Bosnia, Herzegovina, that this used a former banker uh, in 300 meter uh, below ground. This is a plan of the bunker, so a bunker, uh, that is used for the biennial. And now there's the first biennial online, only online biennial, which we still have to pay. So we went to India for their first biennial and conceptualized theory. Uh, um, First biennial, which happened in Kochi, which belongs to this corridor, IT corridor, so we propose some kind of IT data center mixture. Uh, now we won the competition of Miami Beach Convention Center, which also is an art Basel house, so we are actually very interested in this team of the, this kind of art events and biennials and perennials. So, so this is the last batch. So um, I'm talking about, um, we are of course doing art projects, but we're also doing many commercial projects. And it's no secret that uh, Rem Kohlhaas, our found, founding partner, is the one who actually argued for the potential of the skyscraper and mixed use. So this is a downtown athletic club where many pro a different program coexisted in the same plan, but also sectionally. So that this kind of uh, oyster bar next to boxing club uh, actually could happen. That was his uh, comment. And also, the land values goes up and up in any given city nowadays. So there's a need of mixture. So my uh, idea is that uh, mix, mixed use is becoming the generics. So when you teach at the universities, mixed use is kind of multiple colors as kind of uh, default nowadays, as if you don't have to seriously think of each typology, which we, we think is a problem. So you can basically escape of being serious about architecture because you can always say this is mixed use and it's cool. But I think that period is over. So we are really contemplating what to do as an architect. This is a city of Tokyo, big enough to have multiple districts with multiple characters. If you analyze this to a, a, a table, dinner table, it's an a la carte style, different dish, everyone has different way of eating, um, conversation stimulator. But now this is, for example, two mixed-use commercial towers in the center of Tokyo that has exactly the same formula of office, museum, and all the program, which we call it a kind of bento box uh, program. It's kind of pre-packaged, uh, program under uh, a hermetic tower. So what used to be very 
conversational and energetic now is very homogeneous and kind of predictable because everyone is eating uh, uh, bento. And that's, <laughs> that's a problem for architects because if you are dealing with mixed-use building, you're, you think that each time is very different, but the program is more or less the same. So that's why you have to mobilize the skin or the height or everything. And we think that as an architect, we should say something a little bit more to the programming itself. So I show you a couple of projects that uh, we have been doing, including the Santa Monica. Um, so what we decided is not to go against the pressure of developers, but somehow create unknown from unknown ingredients, because we know that the developers' uh, rules and formula are quite strict. So these are kind of attempts. So first project is in Jersey City, across Manhattan. Uh, Jersey City's uh, renaissance came ironically after 911 when my, uh, financial district had to move. Uh, this was a proposal that developer gave us first, but we politely declined and somehow said, why don't you give us a chance to really take your seriously, but to come up with something else. So we looked at the program that they gave us, conceived a perfect uh, volume for each given program, defined by developers known, and then stack them on top of each other like a wooden block. So what happens is that it creates a vertical uh, public spaces throughout, but also in each boxes it's a perfect plan. So these are the terraces, sculpture garden, hotel terrace, residential terrace. So this was our kind of initial idea that you make a building as if you basically stack generic buildings around on top of each other, but as a whole, creates an icon. Also the facade is deliberately made banal so that to reinforce the idea that it's assembly of existing typologies. But the effect on the skyline is quite big and obviously with the premium of cantilever, the plan in each box is like the perfect planning so developers were very happy. Uh, this is another one, another interpretation of this uh, thread. Uh, this is in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo has changed the uh, center four times. Now it's a new center. As you know, it's a very vertical city. Our site was L-shaped, very peculiar. Uh, why? Because uh, it will be surrounded with future developments designated as a new center, as I said. But there's an art school here and there is a Walmart here. So it's, we are sandwiched by Walmart in the uh, art school, which is kind of, we thought was the extreme opposite. Um, so we made um, instead a kind of vertical stack, but of the horizontal bar, almost making a screen between art school and the Walmart. And uh, also telling Brazilians that, you know, Brazil has been always very good at using exterior space as a public domain. So we inserted this public domain as a sky lobby in every break of a different program. So you see it's just a big wall, but uh, you have all these public spaces sandwiched. You can see the effect, this is a Walmart. At least we convinced them that they have to make their roof green. So you can see the effect, how big it is. Ironically, when we won this competition, it was like two days after Niemeyer had died. You know this Copan is, is actually, this is to scale, it's very similar scale, just not curved. These are the intermediate floors. What's interesting is that uh, because the site is constrained, because the Walmart will be built first, so what we're going to do is to build the cores first and then start building the building from top to down. That saves some time for construction. Um, I have this theory that the human, uh, the biggest ego was often represented as a tallness, the tower, but I personally think it's walls. Uh, so you, you see the kind of megalomaniac projects proposed by our fellow architects in the history.
So we, we learned that the actually client acquired a site next door, so we just told them, why don't you continue <laughs> and create a great wall, <laughs> great wall of cell power. Okay, finally, I'm going to be done in five minutes. Uh, so this is a site in Santa Monica, uh, fourth in Arizona. Um, of course, Santa Monica always had this uh, great relationship between inside and outside, and the program and the uh, landscape. This is Arcadia Bathhouse, existed in the beginning of uh, Santa Monica. Our site was also at the edge of the local community and the uh, um, visitors. So we also wanted to make something that entertains both. Uh, in, with a brief, we were given that we have to conceive some, we have to have some open space. We thought that we could just have open space for every possible program. So what we, this was, let's say, a typical solution for this, where we decided to collapse so that each program has a, a, a very direct relationship to the open space. This is the... Uh, uh, um, in the in the Bible, in the um, not a Bible, but the uh, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which is uh, the, the king of Babylon made it for his wife who missed the land. So basically, it's considered as a symbol of the land, as opposed to the Tower of Babylon, which is considered as a symbol of tower. So we wanted to be told a client that you know this is more like this, not uh, not the symbol of uh, tallness. So we collapsed the program again and made the gardens for each program. We also put many smaller objects on top of the platform so that it reflects also a smaller scale. And also in every intersection of different program, we can see the mini building we so-called uh, to enhance the potential of mixed use. And then we have a cultural function in the center where there is no so much daylight, uh, but in the, on the ground level, almost like a heart of the building is a culture, and that has either will have either children's museum or the art gallery. Now let's show you the animation, and we will finish. mini buildings.
In the first council meeting, we had some hiccups, but uh, in December, we are supposed to get only approved. So the first major building in LA. Um, well, Darren Williams, who is here today, uh, she was a project architect. Uh, she was pregnant, so she delivered uh, the building and the baby at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. We often, first of all, we are not making fun of ourselves, we are trying to entertain you, but yeah. anyway. Uh, but we are very self-critical that we think is a quality of OMA in general. But let's say that uh, it sounds like we are just creating a linear process with a client and as if using client's drive as the, the architectural outcome, but oftentimes when you see the process, which I didn't show today, of course we try so many different uh, ways and it's never linear. And actually even if we have a very plausible narrative, which we care a lot about a project, if the outcome, the form, or the beauty <coughs> aspect is not good enough, we, come, we go back and re-examine the narrative. So we often consider uh, as uh, not someone that doesn't care form, in polemics, but we do care a lot, and we do so many studies, and it's never this clear. <coughs> what is the basic program that the city of Santa Monica gave you, well, in terms of height and density? Huh. Uh, basic program was never really defined. Uh, of course, the, there was a vague data, which was about 90 feet, I think. Um, but the program was up for each developer. It was a developer's competition. So there was only thing what we had to make sure was that we had to have affordable housing and uh, this plaza that can house the existing skate ring. Were there any height restrictions? 90 feet. Around. Are you from Santa Monica? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, they're going to go through this for a year from now. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to talk about what may be a mixed message um, among all the messages. Um, uh, you didn't show it, but we all know the kind of elevation of uh, all the towers that it's from.
sort of like at pi g of keto and ethic, we let all the energy dissipate. And on the one hand, do nothing, you could say. Uh, a, a twisted version of nothing in the sense that then the building rotates. That begins a kind of uh, maybe not so secret message that while all of the clowns in the world can go off, uh, with their ego, mm -hmm. we'll we'll let you do that, but then we'll somehow inject um, either humor or irony or maybe a deadly serious spectacle element. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look at all the projects, including the final one. Um, the, the, the the kind of the kind of conceptual position is that MMA doesn't contribute to aesthetic defeat. You, you don't, you don't abet it, you resist it. Do you believe that? No. Um, I think uh, there was a moment um, after the crisis or before the crisis when we were very heavily involved in Dubai operation. And since China, Dubai happened you know, in, in a row, our office was very reactionary. And I think I was glad that at that moment I came to the United States where it was not so, you know, uh, grand or, you know, um, uh, there was always enough context that you can actually draw from to shape. And I think uh, OMA had lost a little bit of its uh, time or value or marketing moment when they became too reactionary in the Middle East. Um, so I thought that we have to restore that. So I, I was doing in the US a little bit more carefully designed uh, projects, but the, the aesthetics is still very uh, element, elementary or never so elaborate. But for example, this uh, the, the house for the uh, Filipino collector, we think it's it's in the same line in a programmatic thinking and so on, but it, we are not ashamed of having a very contemporary form. Um, so I, I think it's a transitional moment. I think uh, REM has a very, very strong resistance to easy contemporary form, but as I'm, I'm promoting a slightly younger generation or thinking as a younger generation, I don't think we can afford to be so uh, immune, or so, so, how to say, afraid of creating something that looks something and that still projects certain energy. But, you know, but the, the mixed use projects, especially, we are trying to avoid form because they are, again, we are trying to promote more of a different experience than a typical uh, mixed use. So I guess that in that way the form slightly disappears and we uh, become kind of polemical in, as if we are in the developer's game. And that's very important for us to conceive something else. So I think, you know, we believe in it in a form, in our way, but maybe not strong enough. And I think that's a, that's a, that's always, there's always a debate this thing in your pockets. So, um, so I come here and I represent a different constituency, right? Um, and you lecture all over the world, many different universities, conferences, etc. And you interface with a business reality and market conditions. What is your advice to tools 
on how they can better train their students to prepare them for the real world. And I think, you know, schools have a responsibility to have a certain level of rigor, a certain level of intellectual challenge. But I find there's a lack of practical training so that when these kids come out, they are trained for optimal success. Very serious question. I thought you were going to ask something more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard turn a, my phone call. I heard a thing. You're going, to, you're going to turn it into a slightly more fun answer. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, the observation is very important. I mean, this is, I mean, I never really, I worked in like Toyota's office or something like as an intern, but well, it made the only serious office I worked and I, I can only say through my experience. But, uh, you know, the vision, someone mentioned Venturi, but I think that what's great about Venturi is that he turned vision into observation as a practice or as a part of the practice. I'm not saying you should abandon vision, but observation is quite important as an architect. And now we have so much access to know so many things, what's happening, and we just have to cultivate what you're interested in and pursue and become a specialist of that interest. Uh, that's why for me, um, this kind of perineology, or now I'm doing a studio with Harvard about food, food industry and architecture. Um, that is to pursue uh, what you're uh, interested in, in the real practice, always leads to a slightly uh, more higher ground when you finally get a project, probably after this studio, if I have to design a restaurant, I would probably do it a different way than before. So you always have to you know, instigate your own interests. But uh, in the school, um, I don't know, I, I already mentioned that this mixed use disease is one thing that we have to really abandon soon. Uh, unless you're really working with a serious developer who knows the norms. Otherwise, you know, if you have multiple programs, they just push together, have multiple colors in hand. So I'm very serious about doing a single typology or something that is no one has observed. So for me, food industry is that. Um, I don't know here what's, what the system is, but also the uh, option studio culture is sometimes problematic, I think. Because I come from a very traditional, not known university, but at least there was a continuous research lab that you belong to. Although, whether you liked it or not, of course you choose to go to that lab, but you accumulate knowledge. And you, when, you, when you're out of the university, you can probably say, at least I know one thing a little bit better than the other. Right now, if you just repeat the options to your three times, you just come out as, well, maybe, designer but never a specialist. And I think that's a problem. And I also think that uh, I didn't show today but the VAP maybe it's not a fun answer, so uh, the you know the values are changing and you know we work oftentimes in a countries that you don't even share the notion of human rights. You know. And I think as an architect when you have to design a library for human rights and dehuman rights, of course that's a difference. So you just have to be very open and open-minded and uh, understand as much as possible that there are different values. I think that's also important. Yeah, thank you. 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 I think that's a kind of comment that I can't really say. I think the friend can easily say and create a aura for him because, you know, Donald Judd versus what he does is so, you know, magically different. But, uh, or the same in terms of philosophy. But I was never really influenced by uh, uh, a single artist or writer or a movie. Uh, I was always influenced by my kind of background. 
think that there was uh, enough back, background as a whole where I was always kind of influenced by, you know, economic, economical ups and downs and um, moving from one place to another. But I, I wish I could say uh, somewhere. Investment trusts are a lot of the ways that developers build buildings, and they're based on very homogenous, tight rules. And specifically, mixed use is like very hard to pull off because investors need to be clued in like 20 years in advance on one single typology. So therefore, if you mix them, that becomes like incredibly risky to fund. How, like, I don't know how your projects are funded, but how do you like propose these experimental typologies and still get funding for it, or like? Um, actually, that's why this kind of notion of very generic. Um, almost perfect volume works because it's quite flexible. So mo many of the office grid that we are using could be easily turned into residential grid. Also, it's often very compatible with uh, parking grid. So it's really creating certain, assuring certain flexibility. Although you know, the first designation of program is defined. So you can't just create a very elaborate free form, but as long as you're keeping and respecting certain, you know, as you say, constraints in your face, and as a whole, it could look, you know, semi-iconic, but uh, in each boxes, it's a very banal plan. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the way that we're in. First of all, do you really think what May is now methodical after seeing my presentation? Because I think compared to like uh, the RK or post or May people, they actually become even more rigorous about as if there was no design, you know, struggle. But I, I at least expose, you know, try to expose what was behind or what the context was a little bit more specifically because I really believe in more specificity than homogeneous methodolic, method, methodological, so, <laughs> methodological uh, uh, solution. And uh, what was the second second observation was? I mean, it was more of a comment in terms of uh, when you're competing, let's say, against somebody like this. But are you critical about X or M A people doing O M A methodology? Absolutely yes. Why? Everyone has to invent their own, and you don't think invention comes from a slight uh, resistance or 
development of the past learning? No, I think I think it is certainly about building on top of something that we exist in the back. And there's always going to be a certain point where you start a certain kind of design methodology. But uh, in the context of the more, I would say, formulaic commercial projects, uh, to me at least, from my perspective, it becomes not from your perspective, but from their perspective, a kind of a derivative of the overall development project. Then my curiosity is, does it become an issue for you in your design discussion internally? Yeah, we, we discuss quite often, but I don't. I really am curious what you then. How do you gonna establish your own design methodology? Your own learning, it's something. And I think that innovation, sense of innovation, is a very good question. But uh, I think that innovation can come from also, uh, you know, very small uh, programmatic idea or technical idea. I mean, I don't know what kind of caliber of innovation we're talking. About. I mean, next speaker I heard is uh, Patrick, and we are right now teaching the same course in the same studio at GSD. He presented this kind of everything new. Program should be new. Methodology should be new. Uh, everything should be new to innovate architecture. But I personally think uh, you can also have innovative mind uh, by observing what's happening, observing the changes, and then innovate the role of architects in the society instead of innovation of you know, technical facade or glass or whatever issue, uh, which we also do, but we just don't talk about it. But this is a deep one, so please stay for the dinner. <laughs> What point do you think the cool house becomes OMA becomes almost autonomous regional offices in the kind of trajectory towards bureaucracy? Trajectory to bureaucracy? <laughs> um, well, it's more or less like that now, at least uh, in New York office and Hong Kong office. Uh, but it's still, you know, the media or everyone's mind still playing as a mastermind. Um, it's a similar question to what, what I asked to him. I mean, even if I go independent now, then if, some, if people will criticize, then it's, you're just doing what them have done. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have our own character in New York office under the arm of one brand, so you can imagine the, the, the struggle is. But, um, we are trying to continue the organization even after Larry is Larry retired, which I don't know when he does. <laughs> he has, he's pursuing his own interest, you know, that's a good thing. Everyone is trying to have their own interest. 